So thank you again. Um, we are going to open it up for Q&A, and I see that a few questions have already come in, and we really appreciate that. So if you do have any additional questions, also, please feel free to type those out in the chat box, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, but let's start from the beginning. I guess we can start in kind of descending order. Or do you want to maybe take that first question, and I'll take the second one? The first question is, there seemed to be more media coverage of SJP events. I would like to see more coverage of the pro-Zionist response to those events. Is that something you're working on? Uh, so I'd say definitely. And first, I'd like to address why some of the structural issues behind why the anti-Zionist movement gets so much coverage, um, even if it still doesn't represent a critical mass of even university students, let alone the wider public. And I think one of those things is just general, like you cannot ignore baseline anti-Semitism and how that feeds into conspiracy thinking. Um, and so it, coronavirus is no different. We've already had cases. I had cases at GW where the school was discriminating against students for going to APAC and specifically targeting like the students that they knew they were doing that because they were going through Hillel. So these are Jewish students. And you see like that idea did not apply to like the students who attended CPAC, but you see already just those, if, if there's going to be a bias, it's going to be slightly against us. Um, and that pervades a lot of what's going on. I also think SJP and other anti-Zionist organizations have done a pretty good job of putting their movement in terms of a recognizable model. And that model is the South Africa model. There was a divestment movement. There was an academic boycott. And it was seen like just causally seen as being responsible, at least in part, for a change in the apartheid regime. Um, they've definitely been able to put themselves in that mold, and that is very recognizable to the media as something that's like, this is not just, you know, college kids who are um, whining about the next thing. This is actually something that has worked in the past, and so they give it outsized attention. Um, I'd also say that you can't ignore intersectionality and how that plays out in the college campus baseline idea for intersectionality is fairly like honestly I think it's fairly unobjectionable in terms of the theory um, it's just the idea that you're gonna have different forms of bias discrimination anything like that a different lived experience based on le layers of identity so you know a, a black person's gonna have a certain experience and then a black woman's gonna have a different experience and those things don't just linearly layer on top of each other they have a pretty complex relationship. And I think a lot of things are seen through that lens of intersectional oppression. And the Jewish liberation movement, Zionism, has been really cut out of that. It almost in a sense, it doesn't count. Um, even though there's a lot of ways that we're trying to build those relationships on the other end so that that can start working for us and not against us. You see so many Zionist groups, so many pro-Israel groups, Jewish groups just trying to make inroads with other communities. Um, and it really is that person-to-person -person relationship building that's so important in that way. Um, so I think that explains a lot of why there's more coverage of that. Um, and what we're working on is, is those inroads to reverse that trend. Um, and I think it's also important to notice that like having them having like a angry and loud view is not necessarily um, entirely a bad thing. I've met so many students who've been activated because they see that kind of small minority acting in such a way that it makes it very clear that it's not just you know, theoretical anti-Zionism, it's actually really anti-Semitism, and there's actually something to all the history that we teach them about exclusion, anti-Semitism, and all of that. Um, so making those, you know, making those things explicit helps people recognize it helps them put it into a box so that we can activate more students. Um, and I think that you're able to see that with the, the overall trend, I would say, is still not, it's not, I wouldn't say doomsday for the, the pro-Israel side. Like, um, it's in general, people who are not as engaged are more disposed to be pro-Israel to begin with. Um, but I think you'll find that there's more of an activist protest mentality from people who are working against us and that's so that's one of the things that we're definitely working on thanks for thanks for really expanding on that and certainly 
um, touching on a lot of key points um, in terms of the work that we're doing. Um, I'll take the second question about Brandeis just as someone in the Boston area. Brandeis is a campus that we work really closely with. We've been lucky enough to have uh, close partnerships with students there, uh, including participants on our most recent Israel trip, as well as past fellows. Um, Brandeis is a really unique campus. Um, the amount of Israel engagement and Jewish life is really about as great as anywhere across the country. But given the institution's sort of overall ethos built on tikkun olam, um, even though Israel still is such a primary um, an integral part of Jewish life and kind of discourse at Brandeis, things certainly do lean um, heavily to the left there. But I will say there is one saving grace which sort of separates it from other campuses and the fact that the amount of extreme anti-Israel activity, um, I, I wouldn't categorize it as necessar necessarily that bad at Brandeis there is still a certain measure of respect even among people from sort of like more dissenting point of views. And I think that is an overall positive thing compared to some of the other campuses that we work with and that we see. That being said, it's become more challenging. Students um, at Brandeis where I think, you know, even a few years ago and in the past would be more likely to stand up and identify uh, as proud Zionists. It's, it's become more of a challenge, really, really need to work with them closer and to get them to feel more comfortable about that. And I think that speaks to the larger trend that we see where generally Jewish students and outwardly um, identifiable pro-Israel students are just made to feel uncomfortable at campus, on campus. Um, and even though that's minimized at Brandeis, so much of it is connected to different um, social atmospheres that exist. And so many of the students, they even though they care, um, they're often afraid, like they don't want to be the odd one out or they don't want to be the one who speaks out and then gets attacked by other people within the student body. And then unfortunately, um, not defended sufficiently when it comes like by the administration. And that's really where we come into the picture to help them both as staff members. And also, as was mentioned, the work of ZOA's law and justice department, Susan Tuckman, which has been truly invaluable. Um, but overall Brandeis certainly does lean on the more progressive side of it. Um, unfortunately, also, I think the infrastructure of pro-Israel activity has sort of lessened a little bit, even though uh, we are still active there, but the two main Israel groups are BIPAC, Brandeis Israel Public Affairs Committee, um, and another group called Judges for Israel. I think they've shifted also a little bit more towards trying to only do cultural programming where they're afraid to sort of ruffle feathers and bring certain speakers who are going to speak candidly and honestly about important issues just because they may be um, a little bit outside of the common progressive agenda i think that makes them a little bit um, hesitant to do so so we work with them we support them and we're continuing to build up the community there and, and build it back up again but a lot of it also depends on turnover um, i can just tell you like two years ago three years ago the leaders of bipac were like amazing. We had um, two of the leaders as past ZOA fellows. We've had them as participants on our Israel trip and the amount of activity really like shot up in that time. And sometimes uh, things such as uh, just kind of overall board representation can change on campus. And that's sort of something that is a little bit of out, outside of our control. And that's why, as I mentioned, it all comes down to the personal angle, you know, building those relationships with the students, um, letting them know what our mission really is about um, and not based on just like perceptions that they may see um, about ZOA and anything else related to the work we do, um, telling them honestly and truthfully, you know, we're here to help you to defend um, all Zionist students um, who are there to stand up for Israel's security um, and Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. So um, I do enjoy working at Bandai's. Um, the audience there also is uh, definitely more well-versed than in other campuses. So in that sense, it makes it more stimulating and interesting too, but definitely work to be done. 